views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Social Justice Forums. I'm Darren Jaime. And today on this New Year's Eve edition, we take a look back at some of the best of our Social Justice Forum interviews through the year 2020. If anybody asks what the Social Justice Forums are about, well, we have an opportunity to have conversation and dialogue, discussing many of the inequities that people face. We promote civic engagement, and we go into a deeper discussion, hoping to promote awareness, and then also looking at the issue of justice. So stay with us. The Social Justice Forums starts right now. Earlier this year, the police-involved death of George Floyd sparked a national outrage and also an outcry against systemic racism. Organizations and individuals around the world gathered together in protest against racial injustice with a message of more action is needed to help America's Black population. We spoke with experts as well as advocates on how racial and social injustices are built into our workforce, childcare, education systems, and also identify ways to dismantle racism and other forms of discrimination. We take a look at the best that was in the year 2020. I think that the new life is absolutely wonderful. And the reason why it's so wonderful is because it says that it's not only affecting uh, black lives, but it's affecting America. When, I, when that officer uh, took an oath to the United States Constitution to uphold life, liberty, and equal protection under the law, um, he said something about what he would do. And when he broke that, when those officers broke that, uh, then they not only are they responsible for the murder of George Floyd, but America is responsible for the murder of George Floyd. And I think that why so many people are involved now, because they see this as an America problem. Uh, America problem that has not done anything about it. America problem that has allowed it to go unchallenged, uh, not put the necessary reform and policies in place. And then the energy is there. A new culture, new context uh, creates new uh, influences and new voices. So the voices that are out there right now are saying that this is a longstanding problem. It's affecting us. Um, the, those who are not black are saying that this is affecting our friends, this is affecting our relationships, there are more relationships I think, between the cultures and the races now. I think that um, more people are seeing how this can tear down America. The racial problem has been a problem for a long time, but I think this new context, new culture is showing how if we don't do something about this, uh, that, that this rising tide uh, voices will continue to go forward and continue to be just as aggressive as the um, as as the violence that's occurring against Black Lives. So I think that this is a great thing that's going on, and we must continue. And it's a new form of leadership. It's not just one person leading the charge. I mean, we had the Martin Luther King, we had the Frederick Douglasses, we had the Malcolm X, but I think this is a confluence of so many different voices coming together in different places. I mean, when you have places where there are no black people in Utah and Nevada and places like that and little towns and cities that are rising up as a result of George Floyd, this is a whole new culture, a whole new time. And I think Al Sharpton said it best when he said that, you know, at one time um, a, a white woman came to him and says um, that she hated him. And then now a little girl came to him and she said, black lives matter, little white girl. I think that this shows something about the times that we are in and that everybody is looking at it, uh, not, not from a liberal or conservative point, but as a human point. This is right. about humanity. This is about how you uh, deprive lives and how you deprive dignity and how you deprive uh, equal protection under the law. So we must continue this fight and we must continue it with um, the voices, the, uh, the various cultures and the various races in order to tear down um, uh, and not only reform, but 
deconstruct and then reconstruct something new. Um, social justice, it, it is, criminal justice is, is part of that package, um, but it is about providing people with true equality. And so, and that's the reason why people are still marching, right? So it's it's fantastic that we put together this slate of legislation, um, as I mentioned, that uh, Govern, Governor Cuomo put the Say Their Name um, reform um, legislation into place that specifically focuses on some of the issues that we had around police brutality and around how police work with communities. But the fact is, is that if you're really talking about social justice, think of the word social, right? Um, and then social justice has to do with, has a, a larger umbrella of talking about how um, African Americans are treated in education, uh, closing outcomes there. We still um, are, are have great economic dividers. As an African American woman, you make 62 cents on a dollar. And so closing that, that income inequality, that's part of social justice, right? And so it is, it is a, a, a combination of, the, of um, um, different aspects. When it comes to housing, it's still harder for African Americans to get mortgages. Um, we still have suffer from having um, lower credit scores and higher debt, and that's a, that is uh, a result of systematic racism over the over the course of time. People say slavery was so many years ago, but the fact is is that Jim Crow laws were not that long ago. Um, um, uh, the more discrimination in mortgage lending was not that long ago, and then we still have to deal with the inequalities around um, uh, equal pay. And so those are things, systematic things that are still in place right now, and that's why we have to continue the fight. The troubling side is that the cyclical nature of what we're dealing with continues to happen again and again in terms of how we're dealing with basically lynching in 2020, which many people thought that they left behind and never really did. It just took on new forms and new aberrations in terms of its previous uh, state. So in terms of what I find to be hopeful about it, because I don't want this to be a depressing story, is there are some drill downs on policy. So just kind of giving you a quick historical reference on it. You know, 1866, the United States government said, hey, we got to do something with all these free slaves. They wanted to pass all these laws. The president's like, eh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to provide this kind of protection. It led to concrete change, which was the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which we use to this day. So if you fast forward today, there are some very good discussions from a legal standpoint to address qualified immunity. Uh, in the state of New York, the 48 hour rule, what it meant in the past, and in terms of how it affected people, in terms of you can't talk to a police officer or any witnessing police officer after a shooting for 48 hours to allow them to talk to the police or I mean, talk to their lawyer or whoever's to fix it. So some of the policy addressing as opposed to just saying, this is horrible, we need to change that makes me very hopeful. A lot of people who have deliberately turned a blind eye to black injustice in this country, right? To anti-black racism, that's, people have turned a blind eye to that and now they're sort of being confronted with it, with it in a way that they can't. And so we're seeing people on the ground protesting, we're seeing marches, but we're also seeing communities working to say, actually, this time we won't be silenced. We won't be, um, you know, we won't be sort of, allowed to sit in the corner and say, okay, this is where we're going to accept the status quo again. We are actually seeing communities stand up and say, we're working to dismantle those systems that have that racial injustice. And so that that's hitting across all sections. We're seeing that in education, we're seeing it in housing, we're seeing that um, in the criminal legal system, not just in policing and bail reform. And so a lot of these things, you know, I'd be remiss if I made it seem like all of this was new. This really isn't new. These things have been happening for you know decades. Black communities have been crying out for this and pushing for these changes that we want to see. And it's just now that the world is sort of turning an eye and looking and seeing what's happening. Um, and I think it's important that whenever we talk about this moment, we put the historical context of racism into context, whatever, whatever we're saying, but we also put into context the current crisis that black families are experiencing in America. That's COVID. That's racism, that's economic stress, that's inaccess to resources. And so all of those things have combined to this moment that we're in right now. Well, basically, if you are pregnant in the United States, we shouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, this, is, this is a huge, huge thing that we sit back and scratch our heads. Social justice just means just that. It is justice for us in the parameters of where we are economically, where we are geographically and where we are demographically. And there is a big disparity between the three. The fact that we're here in the United States and we have to talk about this issue means that there is an intentional 
non-implication of these services. So that means they intended not even to offer these. So whatever it is that we have, we have to provide it for ourselves. Well, nine times out of 10, we as people of color, especially, we tend to do things the way it is comfortable for us and as things are necessary. So necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. However, we have to make sure that we are up to par with that when we deal with maternal health care. We can't be dealing with 60s mindsets. And we're talking about going into the new you know, 21st century. So I think that what we're doing now is we're becoming more aware that there is a disparity. And now this is where the advent of help, help comes. I had one mother say that she really wanted to leave um, New York. Um, and her reason was, she said, I'm raising a black man in New York. She said, that's the most dangerous area in the world. I said, well, you know, more of the people that are being killed recently are down South. So if, where are you going to go? So she said, well, I'll go into Canada. Or I said, well, those are the ones that are not reported. Don't think that it's not happening. So the stress level is really becoming a big thing where women are saying they're going to distance themselves from communities and countries. Um, a couple of women are saying now they're going to be expats going back to the continent of Africa where they don't have to worry about that. Yeah, but they have civil unrest there too. You look at Nigeria, right. look at Cameroon. Right. You know, there is civil unrest wherever you go and it's because of unjust government. So why don't you stay and bloom where you're planted? Instead of leaving the area, I always recommend train a child up in the way in which it needs to go. So if there's a civil unrest for black men, then who would be better able to stop the civil unrest than black men? So make sure that you are in a tolerant area that allows men to be empowered, that allows the decisions to be made in their lives to be done by them, and then allow their environment to be safe. Stop tolerating injustices that are uh, normalized, like the, the no snitching rule, or you, know, you don't tell what's happening in the community, or mind your business, and you don't get involved in it. No, get involved. Get involved and stay involved, and allow the men to have that voice to say, man, you're not going to touch this woman this way or you're not going to handle this this way and allow the men to step up and do we used I grew up with that I grew, we call them basement parties you know I grew right. up with men taking advantage of the fact that you're just not going to put your hands on a woman in my presence you're not going to do that and we lost that and what's unfortunate about that is we've lost the power in our own communities thus that allows other people to come into our communities and take the power from from us even more so I'm telling the women to arm themselves with knowledge, information, and the power they already have. There's more of us than there are of them. So remind their children that the more they are empowered together, the stronger our community can only be. So this is where I'm going with it. And every time I have a boy baby, I actually announce it. Here's another warrior being born. So it's a it's an incredible passion and energy that's going out there. And I'm, I'm just glad to be a part of it. I would say the first bucket, of course, is you know, systemic racism. <laughs> mm -hmm. Systemic racism is, is, you know, I mean, it's something that we've been talking about a lot in the press. So um, people have been hearing a lot about that. But, you know, it, you know in, in our minds as Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, we're very clear that systemic racism and economic inequities are, you know, contributing to the outcome, the, the, the adverse outcome of these health disparities. And you see these wide gaps in um, communities such as the Bronx because access um, is, there's a barrier to access. And that's because of the systemic racism that, in, that exists within large systems such as our healthcare system. Um, and also that contributes to implicit bias um, that is, is experienced by many people in the healthcare system and from their providers and from the system at large. Um, and so when we talk about um, various health outcomes that have huge gaps, and the list is enormous, right? We could talk about um, more specifically like maternal, maternal um, mortality rates. Um, and most people have, you know, brought this up, and I'm so happy that this is a point of discussion uh, in a lot of spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but we just lost, you know, a young woman in Brooklyn um, on July 3rd, Shy Asia Washington, um, who was getting a cesarean section to have her, to give birth to her beautiful baby. Um, and she lost her life. Um, and people, uh, you know, are by right, you know, upset and, and have uprised because of that. Very similar to, uh, you know, um, Amber Rose Isaac here in the, in the Bronx, not too long ago as well, who was also 26, who lost her life. 
Um, and so when we look at those numbers, when we look at those incidences um, and those cases and the lives that have been lost that are completely avoidable um, in a system where we don't want to talk about racism, we don't want to talk about the systemic racism, those are all things that contribute to the, the, the very deeply rooted mistrust and distrust within our community, in the healthcare system. Uh, what I'm excited about is there has never been greater awareness about the discrepancies between the rich and the poor. Um, sadly, it took the death of so many African Americans this year. Like, hello, the, 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 the bells were going off for years. The alarm clock was going off for years. Did we really need George Floyd to be asphyxiated the way he was for us to say something's not right in our communities? I think not. But again, let us remember his name, let us remember the pain, and let us come together to really grow something better, to really reimagine the way we look at children, the way we look at, at problems. Listen, when plant, I'm going to give you a simple plant analogy. When I grow plants, if the plants don't work, I don't blame, don't grow, I don't blame the seed. We look at the environment. Did I give them enough water? Was the soil healthy? Did they have access to light? We need to start looking at marginalized communities the same way. We can't keep blaming people for being poor. I will tell you that here in the South Bronx, being poor is a tough job. It has never been harder than ever. And the pandemic has really called attention to that around access to the internet, around access to devices, around access to healthy, fresh food. Now, my goal, and thanks to you, your job is to make sure that we cultivate an appetite for equity. It's no longer enough to say, oh, I'm not a racist. And I believe I meet a lot of people each and every day who say they, are, who say they aren't racist and probably believe they're not. But what are we doing in terms of policy that demonstrates that we are actively anti-racist in all that we do? You know, I jokingly say, I'm getting tired of philanthropy and there's been some amazing philanthropy this year. So for those who are donating and contributing and the movements that we see across the borough and across the city and the nation, God bless you. I feel you, I see you, and I appreciate you. But here's the deal. Philanthropy will send a whole bunch of bottles of water to Michigan and we'll judge the efficacy of that philanthropy on how many bottles of water we send. But what we really need is good policy. And good policy will make right. sure that those residents have water for life and people who violate that will be dealt with accordingly, as in prison, because that's what we need to do. We need to stop selling the rights of our children and the future of marginalized communities down the drain for you know quarterly profits. We need to really get to compassion. We need to let empathy be our North Star. And I'm really excited that you know the election is over and uh, one virus is coming to an end, as is another, and hopefully we can look to better, brighter days for all of us and the planet. That's what this is about. Well, a lot was said on that matter. We're taking a quick break, coming back with more when we talk about another issue, and that issue, communities and mass incarceration. That's when we return here on the Social Justice Forums. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. Well, it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality.
most at risk for coronavirus. People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. And welcome back to the show. We are looking back at the best of our social justice forums in the year 2020. Communities gathered together to voice their concerns about mass incarceration as well as police violence. Individuals believe the criminal justice system was designed to disproportionately impact people of color. Advocates are currently fighting for criminal justice reform in an effort to decrease police brutality, as well as improve accountability and decrease the United States prison population. This while addressing racial injustice. We take a look back now at some of the best interviews we had in this particular field in the year 2020. We know that police have a responsibility but we can't rely on their irresponsibility. So we have to be responsible and we have to empower ourselves. And far too many times when we have their interaction, we're expecting them to do something for us. How ironic is that? You're expecting the police to actually do something for you. It seems that that is the American way. You call the police, they come to help. But in our community, the police are called or the police stop you and oftentimes it doesn't lead to help, but in that moment, in that interaction, you're looking for help. So we need to understand that there is no law that says that they have to tell you why they stopped you. It's not written in a patrol guide. It's not codified in any New York statutes. So when you ask the question, officer, why did you stop me? You should know automatically that he or she does not have to give you a reason. and if you're playing chess and not playing checkers, you should anticipate that even if they had an obligation, non-legal obligation, that they're not going to give you that information. And that has been the history, the long, long history in how police have been more militarized, less community-based, and how they treat our communities. I think more importantly, the police are not the right responders to people in distress in any community. When you're in distress and there's no mental health resources, you call the police. And in most communities, there is no urgent mental health community. So you call the police. In communities of color, there's even less healthcare opportunities for people. So they're waiting till someone gets sick and then they're calling the police. And the police were never meant to handle mental health crisis. I always say it's like sending a plumber to do heart surgery. That's, it's a healthcare need. It's not a command and control law enforcement need. A lot of people are thinking like, well, maybe we'll just add a mental health res responder to the police and have what they call co-response, a police and a mental health team worker. That is not the right solution. And I'll tell you why. The people who started, the officers who started CIT training internationally, CIT International, just the mere presence of a police officer is still gonna get people scared. It's still the best outcome is to have someone taken in handcuffs to a hospital, which is not the right approach. Your neighbors are still gonna know that police came and there's gonna be discussion. Well, we are put a proposal together years ago for CCIT NYC and it's getting a lot of traction, mm -hmm. is to have uh, a person with lived experience who's trained in de-escalization and an EMT. It's much like the model in Eugene, Oregon, where they've been working for 33 years, where they have a trained de-escalator and an EMT go out to calls. They haven't had one serious incident of violence to their workers. They only need the police 0.6% of the time. And there are other models that are working now, uh, San Francisco, Toronto, Los Angeles, Portland. They're all going to a model of one peer, one clinician, peer is someone with lived experience, one clinician and one EMT. The EMT is there for if you have wounds that they need to take care of. The whole goal is not to trans people to a psychiatric hospital, which in itself can be very traumatizing, um, but to either treat people at the home or take them to a, a center where you can get some care, but it's not you know, a hospitalization. And so I've drafted a bill um, that I'm referring to as the fourth response which is a non-police response to mental health and substance abuse calls. 
right? So currently, um, when you call 911, there's three responses, right? There is a, you know, a fire emergency response, there's a medical emergency response, and a police criminal justice response. Unfortunately, the police criminal justice response is the default response. And so, you know, if, if you have a person who's having a mental health crisis, you call 911, the police show up, um, they're not properly trained. And so when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And then the police hammer everything. And so you want it with people who are, you know, busted, broken, you know, arrested, and oftentimes killed. Um, and so we're hoping that this legislation will be able to get passed um, to provide another way for us to deal with those kind of responses. And I think that those uh, are, are kind of the way that we're, we've been moving. Like th there's a Black Lives Matter revolution happening. Um, and the moment became is like, how do we center and empower a community that have been the most harmed? You know, this country and the city has, and people who have been uh, people of color and communities of color has seen the, the communities not being under, uh, being underfunded, over incarcerated, and over police. And Rikers Island was uh, the tail of, 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 two, uh, of two cities, you know what I'm saying? The abilities of, of knowing that Rikers or, or, or the, the jail system has not operated the way that it's supposed to operate, right? Like it was supposed to make sure people are being returned back to society and have all the proper tools that they actually need. But our residuum rate is 70%. And Rikers Island is known for years, years for people going in and never coming out. And it's known for gladiator school, torture island, and when people go on that bridge, they know what exactly they're supposed to, supposed to expect as a human being and how you're supposed to react. You know, we know that Rikers Island for per person is approximately 330, 40K. When we come and look at some of the, uh, what we can actually do with that money, it only takes 30 to, 30 to 25K per person to take them through reentry, to give them the resources they need to get their self and their platform and their abilities or their life back in the right place. I think there is a moment as a, as a city that we knew that the time for Rikers Island to end, to close was now. And, and now is, is we're beyond the, the talking point. I think the train left for that talking point. And I, I mean, when I, see, I mean as closing Rikers, because people has as directly impacted person like as myself, I know this was the right path. Um, having the city close Rikers Island, going to 12 to four jails and improving conditions for anyone who's remanded because we know violence is not going to happen. It's not going to end tomorrow. We have to keep investing in communities that have been the most harmed, especially the eight communities that are filling our jail system up, that are, are the most impacted by police um, or, or, the, or the communities that have been overseen um, around, has, has not been invested in. I think folks are getting choked up on the word defund. But our schools have been defunded for years and it did not hurt us the way that saying defund the police um, is, is seen to causing a reaction in some people. And this is a national conversation. I'm not sure if folks understand that when we say defund the police, I think people are thinking of, oh, where are the beat cops on my, on my street or who's gonna, uh, respond to when I have real emergencies. Yes, we're talking about the militarized way that we use the uh, police department. Specifically, I'll speak to the NYPD here. The militarized way that we use them, the amount of money that we spend um, militarizing the police, and we need to defund those things. The other thing about defunding the police is if you have more money for uh, programs that impact our setting conditions, healthcare, education, housing, those are all connected to uh, crime and policing. There's a, there's, a, there's a connection between poverty and crime. And so if we're not willing to fix the infrastructures of healthcare, education, uh, the cost of living, and all of those things, then we're really gonna be at a disadvantage. And we're trying to shift the money away into those areas of uh, education, healthcare, housing, as I said, et cetera, because we are seeing mass unemployment due to the pandemic, but even before, we're seeing mass evictions that are, people are afraid of evictions that are about to happen. We've seen our cost of living go up, but yet we find the money to continue to fund militarized police, but we can't seem to keep the 22,000 jobs that Mayor de Blasio is talking about cutting because he needs to fix the budget. And that to us does not make sense. There are literally thousands of laws 
across our country that legally discriminate, discriminates against people who have a criminal conviction, especially a felony conviction. Like, like for instance, we're in the, in the voting season right now. There are states in our country that actually, um, that disallows you or, 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 or criminalizes you for, for voting. So you lose your right to vote for the rest of your life because you have a felony conviction. And we have over 20 million people in our country that have a felony conviction. Over 70 million people in our country who have a conviction, you know, whether it's a misdemeanor or felony altogether. So the new Jim Crow are like laws that actually target people to disempower people, you know, like voting, like um, getting a driver's license, um, like getting certain, um, um, like becoming a firefighter. Like in California, you had at one time, I think the law was passed this year, but at once for years, um, incarcerated people were being trained to put out fire and, and risk their lives for like a dollar an hour. But when they come home, they couldn't become a firefighter, fire, you know, fireman because they had a felony conviction. And this is a part, a part of the thousand of laws that, you know, that we basically call as part of new Jim Crow, you know, it marginalizes people, you know, who have, who are formerly incarcerated from different sectors of, of, the, uh, of the job market or, or licenses market. And um, yeah, so that's like just a, an extension of the old Jim Crow. Uh, I've definitely been having that sort of in a conversation with myself about uh, policing in schools and the mil militarization of students. And for starters, I don't think we need police in schools for students to be safe. Um, so I live in the Bronx, but I went to school in Lower Manhattan, and my experiences in comparison to the students in my zone school were completely different. I went to a school that didn't have metal detectors, and I went to a school that had school resource officers, but they were very kind and everyone was friendly with them. In comparison to other schools where they have metal detectors uh, and they have school resource officers who may um, actually make the school environment hostile uh, instead of making it a better and safe environment, which is what we think. I think a lot of people from a young age, even adults associate safety with more policing um, and just like the militarization of students and community members when in reality safety doesn't have to be like that i think with the defunding the nypd the other part of it that people are forgetting is that we're directly asking you to defund them because historically new york state and this country has been cutting um making detrimental cuts to every other system to continue to fund the nypd and the the, the police department so we're asking you, the governor and the mayor to defund the, the, the police, but actually invest in communities. And the reason why I'm saying invest instead of reinvest is because our communities were never invested in. We want youth services. We want to make sure that our teachers are equipped with skills and materials to be able to teach us. Uh, like we want to make sure we have extracurricular activities. The high school students making sure they have like advanced placement courses. It's unacceptable that students are going to school that don't have access to a lot of resources, but they have metal detectors and school resource officers. And even within the conversation of safety is looking at mental safety and like psychological safety and, and employing more counselors and social, social workers and psychologists and even nurses. There's so many students that go to school that don't even have nurses, but they have school resource officers. So it's really about priorities and what our country and specifically New York City is prioritizing with uh, the well-being of not only our, our constituents, but also our students. Okay. Two big things, right? One is accountability, which is a, a decade-long conversation we've been having in, in communities, in the African-American community, in the Latino community, and anybody who knows anything about New York City, right? We could have been talking about the same issues back in the 1960s at the height of both the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, at the height of unrest to demand equality at the height of the the opposition to the vietnam war at the height of the labor movement and the boycott of grapes out in the west coast with cesar chavez and the united farm workers in that period of our history these same episodes of outrageous police brutality were happening every day and we could have easily had the same kind of reforms that we're talking about today so accountability is a long process that now 
because of what's happening in this country only in the last three weeks, um, the combination of so much outrageous violence, state-sponsored violence against Black folk is exactly now positioning us to have to react, perhaps drastic changes in how we think about policing. So that's the accountability piece. And there's more to talk about that and more to figure out what that means. But also when it comes to uh, the integration of the police force, the overall history of the police force um, in New York City and how police officers now, or I should say how their unions are saying that we're being we are also being uh, discriminated against by by the police by uh, excuse me the government and the public. Um, well, the fact of the matter is we have this, what's different from the '60s and today is we have video footage, like multiple ways and multiple times, thousands and thousands of hours of footage showing provoking behavior by police against peaceful protesters. Now, I fully understand that policing is not an easy job. I fully understand that there are times in which there are times in which we have um, uh, opportunities to make sure we can um, address those issues. But for police officers to now claim that they're being the victims when all the video evidence is demonstrating something different, it's a pretty difficult thing for me to accept. When people are incarcerated, even for the most heinous crimes, the vast majority of them at some point will come back to our communities. We know that prison especially does not give people the tools they need to come back to our communities and be healthy, productive members of our society. If anything, we know that they're going to be given a essential, a scarlet letter that would keep them from being able to access many things that they need to be able to ensure that they can provide for themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. So we set them up for failure and we torture them prior to sending them back into community where they're set up for failure, right? Like if somebody was to ask you right now, you know, I'll give you $100,000 for you to stay in prison for 20 years. Would you sign up for that? No, <laughs> like nobody would because we know that it's not a place in which people have, it's not a life-giving place. It's a place that literally is full of death and suffering. And it's toxic for the people who even work there, right? So if you go and meet with corrections officers, there is something that starts to shift in people's brains when they are given like ability to be in power over other people and use violence against other people. And so you see like an uptick with law enforcement officers across the board of um, self-harm or violence in families. So I'm talking about domestic violence. You see an uptick because we are literally creating systems of violence that do nothing but feed into violence, feed more violence into our communities, even if it's indirectly. And so for black people and brown people in this country, specifically black and Latinx people, we are pushed into these systems, right? We're pushed into jails and prisons. We're also pushed into positions where we are the people who are corrections officers, because that is one of the few jobs that pays well in our communities. Mm -hmm. And then you see cycles of violence continue. You see parents who are more abusive. You see partners who are more abusive. You see people being violent with their family members because we are literally training them how to be more violent. So if we want a society that actually is safe, a society that doesn't um, feed off of the blood of our communities, we have to get rid of these systems. And we have to think of creative ways to deal with harm. Because truth be told, we still have murder, we still have rape, we still have child abuse, all these things still happen. So we're not even successful with the systems we have now, right? The vast majority of people who are raped do not report it. Most people out there who are rapists have never been brought to uh, account. There is no accountability for that behavior. And yet we pretend as if our society is safer. So how can we actually start to change the way we think about accountability, the way we think about safety, the way we think about um, moving away from punishment and torture into actually giving people the tools they need to be better people to each other. And we'll be back with more on the social justice forums when we return right after this.
Well, in the wake of the pandemic, we saw a nationwide outcry against systemic racism, which threatens not just the lives of people of color, but also their economic well-being. Economic injustice creates significant barriers, impending the ability of many people to be able to care for their families. Individuals are living off minimum wage while dealing with the issue of having affordable housing, health care, and education. We've had some experts on our show to discuss these and how they're fighting for these topics as well. We take a look at those now at the best of 2020. Gentrification is, it's a, has not only negative connotations right now, but the word gentry is in gentrification. I don't like feeling as if other people are better than me. I don't like it. I don't like to think about it. I don't like to give it any credit. And I think that the, the overuse of the word gentrification as a negative uh, could be problematic. It could be problematic for neighbors, could be uh, problematic for all sorts of reasons. So I've always debated this issue on BronxNet because I've thought that um, the word is a problem. Uh, the reality could be a, a, a major issue for a lot of Bronxites. But at the end of the day, I think we should have the conversation whether or not economic development and what it brings is good for the borough. I say yes. And I know that many Bronxites also believe the answer is yes. So instead of looking at it as a negative, we should flip it and make it into a positive. Let's call it economic development. Let's call it re reimagining our community. That's what's happening, Darren. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's such a negative connotation to that word that I was in a debate a couple of years ago on BronxNet. Wow, did I get crucified on the, on, on the comments. And, and, I, and, I, and I apologize for using that term, uh, Pastor. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is that, you know, this is such a delicate topic. And the word brings so much, um, it, it, so much energy and, and, and spirit that I think that um, we should reevaluate giving this kind of credit as if, as if having new people in a community means that we are getting cultured as if we weren't refined as is. I'm very concerned with what happens when new people are coming in. If you consider those new people to somehow be refining a culture, then shame on you, right? Because we are a people filled with incredible culture in the Bronx. We are a people that are proud of our community. We are people that are, are proud of what we bring to the table. The fact that we have new investors coming in, new neighbors coming in, new businesses coming in, I've always saw that as a good thing. And I, I understand that a lot of Bronxites uh, may disagree. Um, you know, we fought initially to start fight, started off for the right to breathe, right? Now we're fighting for the right to stay. Um, we know we can't tell people not to come and try to live here because this is a great community. I mean, it's one of the last communities in New York City that's one train stop away from Manhattan has not been gentrified, but now here it comes. We have these luxury town, these luxury high rises being built on our waterfront, but none of which are where people who live here currently can afford to stay. So what happens with real estate speculation does lead and bleed and breathe and fuel gentrification. So they're displacing people because the income comes in that can afford to pay higher rents, which then these landlords start charging more rents and that displaces people who live here. So progress is not displacing folks. We're not saying, you know, we, we should not have nice restaurants. We shouldn't have nice, nice galleries or bookstores or, or places that we can go and, and recreate, meaning creating green space on our peninsula, which we don't have. We know those things are necessary for people who live here, who've suffered here, who's fought here for decades to make this community what it is. But our culture is what created this drive. They like what they see. They know, yeah, we want to be a part of it, but don't displace us to be a part of what we created. And that's the problem. And that's why we looked at how can we stop gentrification and real estate speculation? And that led us to, which we haven't talked about, Darren, but our, commu our community came together and created and incorporated community land trusts to be mm -hmm. that natural opposing force to real estate speculation. So when there's public space like our 850 acres of green space or peninsula that's public land, that's not being used to provide a public benefit, we wanna make sure we can identify publicly owned space that we can hold in perpetuity for the benefit of our community to stop the spread of gentrification and displacement.
assembly, former assemblyman Keith Wright had a, a great conversation with some of our young professionals and was talking about the importance of voting. And one of our young professionals said, well, you know, it's just, it's so expensive here to live in, in the city. And you, know, you can't even, you can't even think about buying a brown store or buying a, buying a house. And his, and assemblyman Keith Wright's response was, well, that's because people didn't vote for Mayor Dinkins. And people were like, what? What in the world is the connection? And he talked about how Mayor Dinkins had an investment in making sure that a lot of the properties, particularly in Harlem and in some other communities, stayed in ownership of the city. When Mayor Giuliani came in, he decided that he was going to sell off all those properties. And so when those sell, when those cities, when those places were sold off to developers, then it became um, less affordable. Also, when Mayor Bloomberg came in, he allowed for more foreign investment. And so the combination of not having city properties and the foreign investment led to um, increasing in, pri in prices here in New York City, making it literally unaffordable for most average African-American New Yorkers. And so it was a combination of those forces. Well, how did we get Mayor Bloomberg and how do we get um, Mayor Giuliani? Because we did or didn't vote. And so that was what uh, what um, Keith Wright was really underscoring for our young for our young professionals, which was just a which was just an aha moment for them. And so I think it's important for us going forward to push for um, housing that that provides for making sure that even if people developers are building buildings that there's a certain percentage of it that is allocated towards low income or moderate housing um, and that and that is important for us to push forward and we can do that by making sure that the individuals that we vote into office are representative of our ideals. Um, I think that you know Third Avenue like many of our commercial districts are going to be facing some some pretty drastic challenges. Uh, not only with bringing businesses back, but with understanding the new landscape of what is retail. You know, we've, we've always, our, our bread and butter as a commercial district has always been our ground floor retail. And that's been challenged and threatened by the rise of e-commerce and big box retail. Uh, but now we have COVID-19, uh, which, which is, is threatening those businesses that have been able to hold, hold on. And I think, you know, it's, it's really important when we take a look at race that, you know, we, we do a deep dive into the Bronx. And, you know, the Bronx has seen 20 years of unprecedented growth, you know, reductions in unemployment, uh, increase in GDP, all of these really milestone attributes. However, you know, I, I think the question is, you know, those advances have not touched everyone and they've left large swaths of our community out of the loop. And not everyone has benefit, benefited from that. And a lot of those people who have not benefited are our businesses owned by people of color and women. So I think when we take, take a look at this, we have to really do a deep reflection on what can we do to systems and, structure, and structures to ensure that folks are getting their fair share and that businesses are better positioned to grow, even though times are challenging. I think we all have to just look at the reality and, and say, times are challenging and they're going to be a lot challenging for at least the next two years. Um, but what can we do to assist those businesses and push them towards a more equitable resource path? First and foremost, I was not surprised uh, because I think for women and women of color across the country, you're constantly seeing efforts uh, of pay parity, efforts of gender equity, making sure that we recognize that you should be paid equally for equal work, equal pay for equal work. And this information that we received at the city council was as per local law 18 of 2019 that was passed by the city council in late 2018. And essentially it was led by the amazing men and women of CWA, Communication Workers of America, Local 1180. And they came to us years ago and expressed a concern about a majority of their members, African-American women, city workers, not being paid equally. So we worked together with Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, the Women's Caucus, the council members, Speaker Corey Johnson, and we were able to pass legislation that mandated that the administration put forth data, payroll data, on all 300,000 workers in New York City. Data broken down by race, ethnicity, as well as gender. And what we ultimately saw, as you said in your opening, that there is a huge level of pay disparities between African-American, Latino, and Asian-American city workers compared to their white male 
counterparts. And what does it say to us as a city? It says that if you are a white man in New York City, you will make more than your counterparts. And it doesn't speak to years of service. It doesn't speak to level of education. And once we get that data in early 2021, I'm sure we will see even more disparities with African-American, Latino, and Asian workers with more years of experience, more levels of education, and still not receiving equal pay. And I mean, I think you have to start with the realities and history of this nation. You know, this is a country that's been built on stolen land by stolen labor. Uh, that's the reality of economic development in this country. Um, and, you know, reparations were never paid for that labor. Um, and post-slavery, there also was the intentional state-sponsored destruction of black wealth um, that we saw all across the country from Rosewood to Tulsa, but also in terms of redlining in terms of keeping government benefits from black people having access to that, whether it was welfare or social security or the GI bill or building a home. And so, you know, I think when we, we operate within a system like that, there is no way to separate racial inequality and economic inequality because they go hand in hand and have since the founding of the country. And, you know, you look at the last three months or so, you have 40 million people unemployed in this country. Uh, you have low income people catching hell economically. Uh, disproportionately black and brown, but low-income people of all backgrounds. And, you know, over nearly 600 billionaires have made untold billions of dollars during this time. It's only deepened the economic difference in this country. And so the fact that companies are putting up for their proceeds relatively small amounts of money, um, it is important that there are more partners in this work if they are going to truly stand up and contribute. But I don't think we should also be um, distracted by, you know, a mere change of the, of the drapes and think that we're really moving the room around. I don't think that there are really the resources on the table from a government perspective and certainly from a private wealth perspective that should be appropriate to respond to this kind of inequity. It seems like at this point really window dressing. The stereotype of the homeless person is the person you might see like in a subway station or panhandling on the street. But actually a large majority of the homeless population across all divisions look just like me and you and everybody else. They do not, they're not necessarily panhandling and on the streets. Um, the thing that we're missing with the millennial generation is that we're assuming that because this generation had opportunities to go to college um, and should have completed college, that they should be better off. However, one of the things in my research was that they're not necessarily better off because they have more financial debt um, and they're coming home to live with their parents. And ultimately, they're choosing not to leave their parent. Or if they do choose, now they're choosing shelter as an alternative um, because that's their way of finding independence. So we're missing the whole point of just assuming they should be good. You went to college or some college, you should get a better paying job. But in New York City, between the job market and then the housing market, um, even if they have some college or full college, they still cannot sustain living in New York City. So that is the hardest part to understand. Um, and, you know, on some spectrum of the characteristics, they tend not to ask for help as freely. Um, however, once they get help, they will continue the process at that point. So it's, it's again, a wide spectrum of things. The problem here is a student loan debt crisis. And the problem itself is distributed disproportionately amongst students of color. So we know black women, they have more student loan debt per student than any other group. We also know because of the persistent uh, wealth and wage gap that we see students of color and particularly black students pursue uh, graduate degrees at a higher rate. A lot of people don't know that, that our students of color are some of the most ambitious and successful students that exist. But when you go further down your education track, that means a lot more student loan debt. Um, and what is also a persistent problem is these are these predatory for-profit colleges. These are the schools that have uh, given people tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt and then offer them a degree that is virtually useless when it comes to uh, accessing a high paying job. Uh, so all three of those issues combined are partly why we see a disproportionate student debt crisis. Now on the other end of this is the opportunity for debt cancellation to be a powerful equalizer. And so what we see uh, is that not only will student debt cancellation lift the debt burden off of students of color's back, meaning they can take on other healthy debts like a mortgage, uh, pay off credit card debts, just be more financially secure, uh, but we also know that students of color have 
uh, smaller debt totals. So when we're talking to advocates and we're trying to figure out how much student debt should be canceled for per borrower, we don't need that much. Anywhere from $5,000, $10,000 to $20,000 would wipe clean the student debt burden for most um, of the students of color who are in distress and unable to afford their student loan debt. I, as a black woman, I feel helpless. I feel like I can't do anything. Um, and that was the basis of this movement. It's an economic protest. It is an economic boycott. We are going to go where we are appreciated, where we are valued. Um, you know, people can post on social media all day long. Right. But if you're not really putting your money where your mouth is, it is a moot point. The only time you really see change in America is through blood and money. And um, and I think that since we're the ones who are dying, we see the blood part. And um, due to uh, like all the things that's been happening, you know, Darissa led this movement because we just started talking about our research and the boy, uh, Montgomery boycott. And it was like up to like 65% of their income was depleted because of the boycott. And I think that right now, this is a chance for everyone or black people to use their voices and uh, get their worth. And um, it's pretty interesting how like in all industries, uh, this is really a topic on social media. The fact that, that n women are not getting paid enough. Um, uh, models are not getting paid enough. You know, news reporters are not getting paid enough like in I think this is the moment since uh really big corporate white corporations are afraid of lo they're afraid of losing our money they understand that I we have value and when we use our value change really happens and it's interesting to see how um even San Francisco literally just started the reform police reform with you utilizing citizens to uh respond to non-criminal calls so it's just interesting to see how like we know that money is real, money makes it happen. And, and it's interesting to see how um, that's when things really do change. And um, it's a, they're having a decline. They're having a decline with black support. And it's so wild that a lot of uh, corporations are, are reaching out to keep that black dollar, like to keep that black dollar. They're like making Black Lives Matter statements and, they really don't really value us, like Darissa said. And I think that the fact that we're, with our movement, we're valuing ourselves, as well as making, uh, dismantling all the stigmas associated with Black supporters and black, and black supporting each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what matters the most right now, is the fact that we are creating new relationships with Black consumers and Black customers. And yeah. We're just dismantling all the stigmas associated with black supporting black people supporting each other, and change is really happening right now. Like there's a there's an uproar far as like finances with company with black companies that they're, they're really making a lot of money right now. And I just we just hope with our movement that it's just consistent and it's a, a, a lifestyle change. Well, we hope that you enjoyed that segment. Want to let you know that we've come to the end of our social justice forums as well as our talks about anti-violence. And yes, we hope that you enjoyed it. Now, you can catch this episode here on Bronx's Channel 67 and Optimum's Channel 2133. You can also rewatch it on bronxnet.org. And guess what? If you want to join in our conversation and present your point of view, head over right now to Bronxnet TV on our social media pages, and you'll be able to join in on the discussion. Look, as we wrap up 2020, I encourage you all stay safe. Stay encouraged. Keep this channel wide open. Make sure that you're watching us here on the Social Justice Forums. For all of us here on the Social Justice Forums, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and Happy New Year.